Dave Weinberg covers the Eagles, has for a long time. He writes at PrestonAtlanticCity.com that the Eagles fans are right to be worried about this team. We'll dive into that. And the Eagles, as they begin preparation for an undetermined opponent. But, Dave, uh, the Eagles asked to kind of bring up the intensity at practice today, and apparently they did. Uh, Is this something that they really needed to do to kind of refocus? Because Christmas night, New Year's Eve, they've had a lot of games that just haven't had that intensity the last couple of weeks. Yeah, it was kind of interesting that the players were the ones that came up with the idea. They went to – they meet every Tuesday with Doug, and uh, they broached the subject to him about putting on the pads at least for a day. I mean, obviously you can't, you know, tackle or there's no full contact allowed, but just to – just to get back to ramp up the intensity a little bit, get the, you know, get the uh, juices flowing a little bit. I think that's a good idea because, like you said, they've been a little stagnant the last couple of weeks. And uh, there's really no sense. It. I know that uh, walkthroughs are good just to prevent injuries and stuff. But, yeah, I think once in a while you do have to, uh, to get after it a little bit. And uh, it was good to see them do it today. Is that a little bit of a sign that the players felt, um, not that they were losing confidence, but that they felt uh, that maybe that, the, the, that they weren't um... – Going into the playoffs with a good feeling, I think they were just they were just tired of resting. To be honest with you, I mean they really haven't put on the pads in a couple of weeks now, and uh, I just think that because they have a bye, um, they didn't want to go two full weeks without having that kind of uh, work. So um, I think they just wanted to just you know maybe just focus a little bit more and feel you know just just excited to be playing you know some some uh, sort of football again, even if it's just you know just uh, just a practice for ninety minutes. Uh, Dave, you wrote at PressOfAtlanticCity.com that the fans are right mm-hmm. to be a little bit worried. And then five minutes ago, you tweeted yes. that you're not a homer, you're far from it, but you talked to the players <laughs> in the Eagles locker room today, and you are convinced, mark it down, that they yeah. will win on January 13th, no matter who they face. Why the quick transition and pivot? Uh, just, uh, you know, I, I wrote what I wrote yesterday or today because uh, just on based on what I had seen the last two weeks and uh, in particularly Nick Foles and um, they just didn't seem to be in sync. The whole team just seemed to be lost a little bit. And um, I was questioning whether they'd be able to, to, to get get it together, if you will, uh, in time to play in, in their first playoff game. But I'm just going by feel. Um, for what I saw today, everybody was real loose. Uh, they were confident, laughing and joking, you know, when they had to be, but like real serious when they had to be. And I heard what I needed to hear from Nick Foles. Um, he seems to be pu- really putting in the work and making a concentrated effort to try and uh, break out of a little slump there. And I, I just I just haven't seen that level of confidence in the last couple of weeks from the team, and I saw it today. Uh, I just saw it in their eyes and, and, and from what they were saying that they just seemed to have that um, – they just didn't have that mojo back that they had earlier in the year. You know, I, yeah, I've been wrong before. Yeah, but, um, I, I mean, talking to <laughs> we talked to a mock game that really has no meaning, and I thought the point that he made was pretty interesting regarding when you're told ahead of time, hey, you're only going to play a series or a quarter, and you know yeah. you're just waiting to be yanked out of a game. He admitted that the players don't have the same focus. So that last game – was really hard to take a lot of stock in, in in anything at all because of the way that game went. But um, the game against the Raiders, even that that game just didn't have the the same feel. Like they had they had clinched, they had kind of wrapped a lot of things up. Yeah, they had to beat the Raiders to get that number one seed, but they still had another shot even if they didn't win that Raiders game. So it seemed like the last two games were not players like routine, and it didn't seem that they were in their routine. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, um, there was just there was definitely something missing the last two weeks, and like you said, that sense of urgency, uh, that uh, that want to that the need to, to have to win, uh, wasn't there quite frankly. And like you're right, when players know they're only playing a series or when they they really have nothing to play for, um, they're not going to they're not going to perform up to the top level. And um, I think that now that that everything is taken care of, they have the top seed, they have home field advantage, which is not. That seems to be getting overlooked a little bit, and um, I, th- I think it's more important than what people realize. And uh, I just have a feeling that the Eagles are really going to put it together. Now, whether I'm not saying they're going to win the NFC, you know, win the NFC and go to the Super Bowl, I think you know I'll have to wait and see what happens. But uh, I just 
I mean, it's just pure feel on my part, just the sense that I got from being around the guys and listening to them and hearing them and stuff. That uh, I just have a sense that they're they're uh, they're poised to to get back to where they were, you know, a few weeks ago. Uh, Dave Weinberg, Eagles beat writer, press of Atlantic City. What did you hear from Foles today that puts you more at ease? Um, he's not he's not bothered by what happened the last two weeks. That um, you know he's. He seems like very focused on uh, correcting what he needs to correct, um, and I, I've kind of noticed this being around him for you know a couple of years back, like in 2011, 2012. He just doesn't get uh, rattled by stuff. He doesn't let things get to him. He doesn't get too. I know it's cliche, but he just doesn't let himself get too high or too low. Um, you know, he never uh, never reads the press press clippings. He takes the, you know people pat him on the back with a grain of salt. And the same thing with, with criticism, too. I mean, I know that the fans are pretty down on him. And, you know, after, after you know, what Carson Wentz was able to accomplish, the, the drop-off to Nick has was, uh, it's been pretty evident the last couple of weeks. So, like you said, I wouldn't put a whole lot of stock in what happened against the Raiders or the Cowboys either. But um, uh, I just – he just doesn't seem to be uh, to rattled, to be rattled or to be bothered by any of the criticism. And I, I just um, – he has a quiet which, confidence about him that you want to see in your starting quarterback. Yeah, which is really the difference in when you have a veteran backup as opposed to just rushing uh, sure. a kid out there, right? Right. I mean, like the the, the suggestion that Nate Sudfeld should somehow play as this ludicrous. You know, he, he, was, he had never played a game in his life until last Sunday. And now he did okay, but I don't remember throwing any touchdown passes. So, he did have the um, highest completion percentage in a game – by any player in his first career game in the Super Bowl era. Wow. Very <laughs> impressive. <laughs> 19 to 23. It's the highest completion percentage uh, by a player right. making his debut ever. Um, no, I, I, I don't. But, but let me ask you this. The way that Doug answered that question yesterday in that left the door open that, it, look, if we're struggling, I might have to consider Sudfeld. Yeah, it was kind of funny because, like, right after the press conference was over, he texted uh, Ian Rappaport and yeah. said, Nick Foles is my guy, had an end of story. And um, I, I guess he was just pre- he was presented with, like, a one-if scenario. Yeah. And, you know, if they're struggling, if they're, you know, it's late in the game, they really need a spark, Nick just isn't getting it done, then maybe you, you try it. The, I can only remember, like, the last time that this happened in the playoffs when Buddy Ryan went with uh, Jim McMahon, I think it was. And obviously it was the last game Buddy ever coached with the Eagles. And everybody in the stands was like, oh, my gosh, what is he doing? This is just this is strictly a panic move. It's never going to work, and it didn't. And that would kind of be, I think, the feeling here. They, they were down by, like, three touchdowns. Maybe you try Nate just to see if he can spark something. But uh, I would seriously doubt if he's, uh, yeah. he's going to play. I think you'd make a much better case for Nate if they pop 21 points you know, three, you know, a couple scoring drives, but the fact that they put a donut up on that board, uh, I think the that's the end of the conversation for Nate. But that being said, this goes back to you have a veteran guy in 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 Nick um, who has not played very well because the Eagles have been in kind of an unenvious situation here of having, look, you play all year for home field and to wrap everything up, which they did, but because of that, the games have been less meaningful, which means. Nick is not getting the kind of preparation that you would hope for in such a short amount of time. Yeah, that's true. I mean, and even Doug mentioned it, um, that the game plan against the Cowboys was just was very vanilla, very basic. Um, Nick was always supposed to try and maybe get something started like in the, in the first series, and he would have if Torrey Smith hadn't dropped the ball. That you probably would have put him inside the 10, maybe even in the end zone. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, yeah, I just, I just think, I, I, like I said, you can't really read anything into what happened in Dallas like you agree to. It's just, they were just playing just to get through, try and get through without any injuries. And uh, now's the time where they're really, and it's, it's kind of tough now too, though, because you don't know who you're playing yet. But um, it seems like they're spending this week just focusing on themselves, and then next week they'll focus on whoever they're going to play, which I guess is the right way to approach it. Yeah, um, if I were to ask you, we, we kind of asked this question in the beginning of the show, Dave, which was if you go down all the teams and ask what their redeeming quality is to say this team can win the Super Bowl. And if you say Vikings, you would probably say they've got a great defense. You say New Orleans, well, they have Drew Brees. Um, you know, every team has kind of something. What would the Eagles' answer be? 
I don't know. Does Jake Elliott count? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> they have a kicker who can kick a game-winning field goal from 61 yards with the game on the line. That's good. Um, I, in the Eagles' case, uh, it seems like it's more of like an intangible thing that uh, they've overcome like so much this year to get where they are that I just wouldn't be I wouldn't be surprised at all if they kept it going. You know, you talk about all the players that they lost. Um, Jason Peters, Darren Sproles, Jordan Hicks, Carson Wentz, of course. And yet somehow they just seem to have that um, innate ability to, to overcome all that. And uh, that's why I don't think you can really bet against them at this point. I mean, they've they faced adversity more adverse, as much as or if not more adversity than most other teams, yet still seem to to find a way to get it done. You know, people were you know, moaning and complaining about, you know, how they played. They said, well, we were still 13-3 and three, and 13-2 and two in games that matter. So, you know, I, it doesn't matter what they look like as long as they keep getting it done. And I think they, I think that's that's probably the quality that I would lean on with the Eagles more so than a player or a position. Um, your thoughts on Jay Ajayi? He's not practicing. The knee's been a little bit of an issue. But did they sit him out uh, they, uh, of the game last week? And are they sitting him out of practice right now? Because that's the guy they want to lean on. Like, hey, this team was about Carson Wentz, but now we've got to focus on somebody different, and that guy will be – will it be Jay Ajayi? Uh, Doug seemed to indicate that yesterday. Um, you know, he seemed to be leaning towards the, that uh, Jay's going to be the uh, the focal point of the offense, at least on the, on the running game. They do have to establish the running game, but – I don't know that I would necessarily just lean on Jay Ajayi to do that. I mean, I think that Garrett Blunt has done a very good job in his role. Uh, and Corey Clement's been a, a huge surprise. Uh, so I think if you put all three together, put them in the right situations, then I think you might have something. But, yeah, they do have to establish the run. I mean, the more pressure they can take off the neck, uh, the more that, you know, they ease the, uh, the need to have him do it himself. Uh, I think the better off they're going to be. I'd say they lean on their running game and their defense. Now, Dave. In 2013, I was not a big Foles guy, even though he made me look like an idiot okay. virtually every single week. <laughs> okay. uh, I just never thought that he was a franchise guy. I give him all the credit for how he played. But the right. one thing that I that he did that year that maybe they can – I know they're studying the film of that year. But the one thing yes. that he did in that year that maybe they can try to recreate is is utilize Alshon Jeffrey and the 50-50 ball, which I don't think they've utilized – nearly enough this year with his skill set. But Riley Cooper was like Lance Stallworth out there. I mean, this guy was unbelievable <laughs> in 2013. Now, <laughs> I mean, he was unbelievable. Um, if yeah. they can yeah. – and Nick showed that he could get that ball up and let his receivers do some work. And in that year, Cooper did work and Jackson did work. I don't know that they have utilized that aspect from Nick enough. Yeah, that's true. I think part of it is the fact that Nick didn't play all year, uh, so there, there's, he's still trying to get in sync with with Alshon, uh, with uh, Nelson Aguilar, uh, even Zach Ertz. I think the more that's why there's two weeks of that's having to buy. I think it's huge for them, especially for Nick, because that gives them an all extra week to, to work with those guys and get ready for the game. But yeah, you're right. I mean, the, the notion that he somehow can't throw a deep ball is is ridiculous. I mean, he's got as strong as arm as anybody, and he proved that in 2013, like you mentioned. And Alshon, is, is, he is that guy. They can go up and get the ball. I mean, if you're right, just throw it up there and let him see if he can out-jump guys, which, you know, he's proven that he can do. So, uh, yeah, that, that's a, that's a, uh, that should be a big factor in the, in the game coming up, I think. Um, you write about it at PressOfAtlanticCity.com that you like the Eagles' chances against Atlanta or Carolina and not right. so much against New Orleans. So – uh, how do you like the, the the Atlanta matchup first? What what is it about that they played them last year and beat them in a year that they went to the Super Bowl? I know that was last year, but uh, that Atlanta team is similar. Yeah, they just seems too inconsistent for me though. I just I mean they look like uh, the team that went to the Super Bowl one week and then the next week they look like they're going to go like you know two and fourteen. They just can't seem to uh, to put it all together. They have the they have the right complement of players, but for whatever reason, I guess maybe it's that those Super Bowl hangover that people talk about. But I just haven't been impressed with them. And I think they're like one in seven in their last eight trips to the link. And uh, I, I just I just have a feeling that the Eagles match. I think they match up pretty well with them. Uh, Carolina, now that game, they went down there. It was, what, a Thursday yeah. night. And Carson had three touchdowns in that game. I think, correct me if I'm wrong, if you remember, 
I think that was the game that Mills had that interception that really kind of sealed the deal that night. So that was a that was a tense kind of back and forth game that Carson Wentz was a big part of. So mm-hmm. would you feel that Carolina coming here uh, that Philadelphia would be a favorite? Yeah, I do. Um, that was see, that was one of the games I think I picked Carolina to win that game only because it was in Carolina. It was a short week, and I just thought that that would be you know a huge advantage for the Panthers. Turned out not to be the case. Uh, I do remember that. I don't think Luke Kuechly played in that game, though. And if he plays here, that could be the difference because he's probably the best linebacker in the NFL. Um, but still, I do favor the Eagles, though. I just don't. I'm not a big Cam Newton guy. I just um, when he's on, he's really he's terrific. But when things don't go his way, it seems like he goes into a shell a little mm-hmm. bit. Uh, struggles really struggles to get things going. And uh, I just I just I don't I'm not scared by the Panthers' offense much. I mean, other than Cam, and I know they've been trying to get Olsen involved a little bit more recently, but, you know, Christian McCaffrey's had an okay year, but they just don't seem to have the weapons that can maybe put up, like, you know, 30 points on the Eagles. I just uh, – that's why I would, I would favor the Eagles in that situation. Yeah, and I don't think Olsen played in that first game against the Eagles, too. He had that foot problem, so that right. would be another addition right. for them. What is it about the Saints that bothers you? They, you know what's interesting? I was doing this, uh, I guess, in the second hour today, Dave. I think most people agree mm-hmm. with you that the Saints, but down the stretch – Atlanta's won three of four. Carolina's won three of four. New Orleans has only won uh, two of the last four. Yeah, but they know what it's like to come into the link and win, uh, even though Malcolm Jenkins and Darren Sproles were on the other team. But uh, they, they're not going to be afraid of uh, coming in. And people talk about their own teams going outside. Well, the Saints kind of you know ruined that, that, that streak when they came into the link in that 2013. And – uh, I just I, I I really hesitate to bet against Drew Brees in any situation. He just seems like a guy who uh, can do whatever it takes to get it done. Plus, they have a, a fantastic running game with Kamara and Ingram. Yeah. That, um, okay. Let's let me ask you about that. Yeah. Okay. The Eagles at the number one rush defense in the league. If a team yeah, that comes in and runs kind of a misleading stat, but go ahead. Okay. So if a team that comes in and runs the ball really well. Would you say that's okay because the Eagles stopped the run, or is that stat misleading? Uh, that's a tough one. Um, I I kind of – I would kind of favor the Saints running game, to be honest with you. So, in other uh, words, you're not buying that the Eagles' def- run defense is as good as the numbers suggest? No. If that's what you're asking, no, I don't. Um, that's not to say that they're not good. They are. But – I think when you go about, like, you know, number one rushing defense, number one pass defense, sometimes that's because opponents can do something else better. Like, if you can move the ball through the air, you're not going to run as much on the Eagles. And that's why the statistics are a little bit misleading. Mm -hmm. I mean, they've had guys, you know, they've only given up one 100-yard rusher. That was to Elliott with the backups. But there were several other guys who came close, Todd Gurley and those kind of guys. They all were in the the high 90s. So, um, I just think – the Rams just have that one-two punch that I think would really pose – I think that would really pose problems for the Eagles defense, run defense. Uh, Dave Weinberg, Press of Atlantic City. Now you're trying to make me change my mind again. <laughs> <laughs> hey, sometimes it's very – you know, in the NFL we say it's week to week, but leading up to this, yeah. I think these six teams could be day to day. In the NFC, yeah. all six teams have a legitimate – argument to say we're the best team in this conference and we haven't even talked about the rams or the vikings yeah yeah that's true um i'm expecting the rams to beat the falcons and that, that's one of the reasons why i'm not too worried about atlanta it's wednesday get this far. you expect yeah. that on wednesday what about by by saturday yeah that's true Good change. I don't know. <laughs> plus you yeah, have I don't know. the rams the rams are just they're, they're a really intriguing team to me that's the team that worries me more than anybody else to be honest with you they just have so much talent, and they just have that uh, let it all hang out attitude. You know, they're 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 playing with house money almost. Yeah. I mean, nobody expects them to be where they are. And the fact that you know Sean McVay's done wonders with that team, I just that's the team that I think the Eagles really, really have to worry about if they get to that point. Uh, they would have to come on the road, and uh, you know they don't have a lot of playoff experience. That's the interesting part about the NFC field, Dave. Is the top three seeds have the least amount of playoff experience at the quarterback yeah. position. The bottom three seeds yeah. have all been to the Super Bowl. Yeah, yeah, it's very strange. Yep. Crazy. It's be interesting to see how that experience plays out. You know? Um, All right, Jim Schwartz, John Filippo, Frank Reich, all name have been mentioned. One, two, or three will be gone. 
Mm, boy. Uh, one, Di Filippo. I think Di Filippo's the guy, too. He's like uh, the McVay. He's the boy wonder, right? Yeah. Would yeah. that would that concern you with Carson? Um, maybe a little bit. He does have a pretty good rapport with him. Uh, you know, they've worked pretty closely together in the last two week, two years. And I'm uh, I'm sorry, but um, I, would, I would have confidence in, in Doug and uh, whoever else, Joe Douglas or Howie, to, to bring in another guy, maybe promote somebody from within to have that, um, you know, to maybe uh, have that same kind of relationship with Carson. Um, uh, yeah, that, that's going to be a big loss for them if they do lose John because he has been uh, – he's had a big role in what Carson's been able to accomplish. Yeah. Uh, should be interesting to see what happens there. Jim Schwartz is going to interview with the Giants and uh, right. John Filippo with the Cardinals and uh, what else was it? The Bears. Uh, right, uh-huh. nothing set up yet, but his name has kind of been thrown out there. Although he's one of those guys that no one quite knows what quite what he quite does, right? I mean, he just kind of – he doesn't call plays, right? Uh, no, Doug, Doug calls the plays. Right. All right. Uh, he, does tell, he, does, he does have a big role in uh, – you know, creating the offensive game plan on game days, you know, leading in the week leading up to the game. But, yeah, you're, you're kind of right. I don't know. I'm not sure what his role is on game days, though. Did you cover Gruden when he was here? Oh, yeah. Sure did, yep. He was Bobby Horn's boy, <laughs> coach. Yeah, exactly. Um, I've heard some great stories about uh, Gruden and Hoying, but uh, I guess <laughs> back then the coordinators probably didn't talk nearly as much and stuff as they do now. Right, that's true. Oh, John, John had a really good relationship. I mean, he's the one who's responsible for Hoyne's like, early success. Yes. And then he left, and Dana Bible came in, and that's when it all fell apart. Uh, oh, I've heard these so, stories. John was, John was a pretty colorful guy back then. You know, real young and didn't really know any better, I guess. But yeah. Yeah, he, could, he could tell some stories. <laughs> all right. Uh, Dave Weinberg from the uh, Press of Atlantic City, at Press AC Weinberg on Twitter, as uh, his coverage of the Eagles as they get ready uh, for whomever they might play. Um, we'll find out this weekend right here on 97.3 ESPN, the wild card weekend. Dave, thanks a bunch, pal. Oh, thanks, Mike, and Happy New Year.